Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Courtney, I'm here with my spouse, Royce, and together we are the ace couple, and it is my misfortune to inform you that we are about to engage in kink at pride discourse. I know, I, I know that everybody is sick to death of this discourse. However, there's, there are some fundamental things that we have been noticing for years that the kink at pride discourse does wrong. <laughs> and we see next to nobody actually talking about it, or acknowledging it, or addressing it. Anyone who even comes close to approaching these ideas is just absolutely buried, ratioed, attacked. And I, I want to make very, very clear right off the bat, we are not anti kink at pride. <laughs> that is not what we're here to do. We come in peace. But there are some things that we do think are worth analyzing. So let's get into that. So the very first issue is how undefined this is. For a discourse that has been ongoing for so many years, people just call it kink at pride discourse, and it becomes this, is kink allowed at pride? Should kink be at pride? Is there a place for kink at pride? So what the absolute heck <laughs> does kink at pride actually mean? Because I see very few people define it in a way that lends itself to having specific and real and nuanced conversations, or I see people defining it bad. <laughs> so Obviously, if you have been exposed to this discourse at all, I'm sure you are well aware by this point that the kink community, the leather, BDSM communities have been integral to the ongoing fight toward queer liberation, LGBTQIA plus rights, and of course, pride, the original pride and pride as we know it today. We are not trying to discredit that. We aren't going to get into the full history because that's just a little outside of the scope of this particular conversation, but I do want to acknowledge that, and we are not going to discredit or take that away by any means. But the fact that the kink community has been so integral to Pride is kind of the... the thing that is thrown around to justify this very usually vague concept of kink at pride. That argument itself is not necessarily the issue, but the issue is what people say in the discourse what kink at pride actually is. Because all too often, I see it boiled down to, it's just a twink in a jock strap. It's just a gay man in a leather harness. That's all that kink at pride is. I feel like I am on a different plane of existence. Either that or you are all lying to me. I, I can't be the only one who feels this way. I really, really cannot. But Royce, you and I went to Pride together several years ago at this point. Kind of, I feel like even before this kink at pride discourse got as big as it has... It would have been before I had heard of it, yes, because it wasn't on my mind while we were there. That's true. And like, people were getting flogged just out in the open in broad daylight during the alleged family-friendly hours. Yeah, so to, to clarify anecdote time, <laughs> this was the local Kansas City Pride several years ago. I don't remember how many years. They had two distinct sections. It was like before, I think, 8 p.m., maybe 10 p.m., something like that, was the family-friendly hour. And then after that point in time, 8 or 10, after dark, was 18 only, like, you need an ID to get in. And we were just walking through, we had gotten into the festival grounds, we were just walking through the shops, and like, in the stalls where there were merchandise, and there were people getting, like, little flags on their faces and whatnot. Yeah, they were like... Face painting. Like, there were children there getting their face painted. And it was, like, next to the henna tattoo station. <laughs> right. And there was a leather stand that had a variety of goods there. 
And at one point in time, when we were turned away from the stall, we started hearing some loud smacks, like, immediately behind us. And this was all fully closed, but a patron had walked by, and I guess I didn't hear any discussion. I guess talked to the shop owners for a test of the merchandise? Well, there there was merchandise testing, but there was also a full-on... St. Andrew's Cross that was just stood up in the like shopping vendor area that people were like stopping to stand by and watch and like taking turns. Like, I don't know if you had to pay or if they were tipping the mistress or if it was just like free for all, just like wait in line for your turn to get (laughs) to get flogged. But like that, that was happening right there in broad daylight during the family hours. (laughs) That was what I was referring to, was someone, like, sitting down on a bench, fully clothed, but receiving hits with a flail and a paddle. Yes, and there there were restraints involved, too. And I, I want to make this abundantly clear. I personally don't really care. Like, me observing that did not bother Courtney. Because Courtney has been to goth clubs, and she has seen way worse in the goth clubs. <laughs> it, it was mostly just a surprise for me. Like, I didn't expect that in the middle of the, the days in the shop area, which when, was- When it kids was, are it, getting face paint. <laughs> there were also no- there was also nothing obscuring visibility. There were Wasn't no curtains. Wasn't in a tent. Nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. And this is why- when everyone's like, well, kink at pride just means people wearing leather. I'm like, what pride did you go to? And did ours just majorly fuck up? <laughs> yeah, so the you started this off by trying to define what kink at pride is. But what pride do you mean? Because there are who knows how many dozens or hundreds, hundreds. of cities setting up pride events every year. They aren't all organized by the same people. No. There, there isn't a central pride authority that is like auditing all of these places. Of course not. Nor should there be because every community is going to be different and have different needs. But, but-, but that means that it's, it's inherently disingenuous for you to say that, well, I didn't see this happening at the one event I went to this year. Therefore, it isn't happening anywhere else in the world. Yes, absolutely. And this is what just absolutely astonishes me about the online discourse because I I actually saved a couple of screenshots because I I see this every year and every year I'm like, why doesn't anyone see what I see? Or are we all just ignoring it for the sake of the argument? But, you know, someone else did this really big thread about here's why the kink community is so important and here's why they are allowed and should be allowed. And this thread was kind of ended by the fact, because of course people will throw around like the think about the children argument, which we're going to talk about here in a bit with some more nuance, hopefully. But I, I understand why people are over that argument, because there absolutely are straight people and like straight parents and more conservative people that aren't necessarily a part of our community that like raise issues about that. And like, they they don't get an opinion. <laughs> like, don't 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 engage their opinions. But my fear is that people in the community who express very valid concerns then absolutely get dogpiled because people are so afraid of this like corporatized family-friendly sanitation that outsiders to the community are trying to press upon us that it kind of has led to this weird climate where even within our own community, we can't really dig into the nuances because... People will just be like, oh, well, you're just a turf, or you're just homophobic, or <laughs> or as, as asexuals especially, there are plenty of people who don't think asexual people belong in the queer community. So as soon as an asexual says, well, actually, maybe is there an issue? They're just like, see, you're not one of us. You don't belong. That's actually something that happens in queer communities that's much bigger and more widespread than Pride is... One, the fact that there are conservative groups that will use sort of scapegoat arguments, like disingenuous arguments, to try to undermine something or try to change something. And we're seeing this all over the place with all of the conservative bills that are being passed. Particularly, you mentioned with the what about the children, that is used very frequently to just harm the queer community. Yes. 
And it seems like there's a pretty consistent, I don't know if overreaction is the right word or phrase, knee but- jerk, Knee jerk, knee jerk. There is a increasing inability to tell the difference between a good faith and a bad faith argument. Mm, that, very much that. Yeah, because we will attack our own just as viciously as we will attack like an openly transphobic like bigot. <laughs> and and that's that's its own problem, but you also see it in this discourse as well. But the thread I was referencing, of course, was kind of trying to head off the arguments about the children by sort of wrapping everything together and saying the fact that parents took their kids there is the parents' fault, not the kinkster who belongs to be there. Belongs to be there. Who belongs there? And this is also, the person making this thread uses the word apparently, which also makes me wonder, like, have you been to Pride? Why are you using the word apparently? I feel like people who haven't been to Pride also shouldn't have a place in this argument because I have literally seen videos of people in the kink community who don't go to Pride for whatever reasons are their own who say like, well, from what I'm hearing, all it is is people wearing harnesses. And it's like, why are you talking about something you, you aren't there to witness yourself? Because of course, if you're looking at the discourse, that's going to be your impression. But this person here says, the most kink you apparently see at Pride is just people in harnesses, leather, and kink-related flags. It, untrue. Debunked. <laughs> but also, they follow that up with, if anyone actually starts fucking, then they'd likely be kicked out of the event, and it's like, there's a consent line between wearing a harness and full-on fucking that nobody's talking about. <laughs> there, there is yeah. a line somewhere in there. You took that from zero to a hundred really quickly. Yes. <laughs> and it, overwhelmingly, everybody was agreeing with these, these tweets. And I'm sure it's the audience. You know, this person doesn't have a conservative audience. They are getting in front of the eyes of other queer accounts who know at least the basics of the history and support kink having a presence in Pride. But then I, this is what I had to screenshot because <laughs> this tweet literally says, kink in quotes, kink at Pride is literally just folks wearing leather. Nobody is breaking out the St. Andrew's cross and a sounding rod during a parade. Are you kidding me? Yes, the fuck they are. <laughs> I, I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> so to go back to consent real quick, and I know we're going to dig into this more, but in order to establish any kind of consent, you also have to properly set expectations. Yes. And there was no like, hey, heads up, there's going to be occasional flogging at the KC Pride during family friendly hours, right? And no. w what do you, what does family friendly even mean? Exactly. <laughs> Family friendly and over 18 means almost nothing <laughs> if you don't actually define that, which is also like kink at pride virtually means nothing <laughs> unless you define that. And, and I, I will be real. I am, I am very much on the sex repulsed side of asexuality, but I find kink endlessly fascinating. I think kink as a concept is way more interesting than sex as a concept. <laughs> So I, I mean, I am no such thing as a part of a kink community, no, nothing like that. But as far as watching videos, listening to podcasts, reading and learning about kink and safe kink practices and the history of the kink community is something I'm very much interested in and, and in favor of. Because kink is also something that is not inherently sexual to everybody who participates in kink. And to people who know very little or next to nothing about kink might be surprised by that, because I think the average person's reaction to kink goes immediately to, like, sexual deviancy. But, you know, as an asexual, I... I do have a bit of a fascination with certain areas of kink that to me and to many other aces just has nothing to do with sex or sexuality or sexual attraction. And you know, I I even had a FetLife account for all of a week. <laughs> oh, me too, actually. I may have made it a day or two before I was like, oh, this this isn't the space I thought it would be. I don't see anything happening here. That's great. Tell me more. What brought you there? And then what, what drove you away? 
curiosity, I think, was the simplest answer, but I I guess I kind of assumed it was going to be more like how dating sites work, but just in a community of people that were all more openly proclaiming kink interests. But from what I remember, I just looked around and it seemed like it was kind of small. It seemed like I had come into a relatively small community of people that knew each other and I was mm. just like the new person to create an account or something. Who, who also has social anxiety and... Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Because yeah, for, for me, joining FetLife was almost exclusively because I am asexual. Because I knew that there are people in the kink and fetish communities who are interested in certain types of play that are not sex. I, I was looking for someone who might be interested in a relationship, and I was like, listen, you know, if I was with someone who wanted me to, like, scratch the hell out of their back, flog them a time or two, someone interested in a little blood play, things like that, I can be down with all of that as long as they do not want intercourse. <laughs> and so... I, I was recommended, well, m maybe you can find someone like that on FetLife. And I was like, sold, let's try it. But the, uh, just like all social media at the time, I was very, very new. I was, it was like probably around the same time I set up this OkCupid account that I just let sit and didn't do anything with for a very long time until you. I just, I poked around on it for maybe a couple of minutes, went, huh, and, and then just logged off and never went back on, so... That's about the extent of that story. Yeah, that's fascinating. Because you, you've you also been interested in and curious in learning about kink things in the past. That's that's something that we both have in common to a certain extent, even though we are both asexual. And for, for anyone who isn't familiar with fet life, obviously, like, that comes from the word fetish. So it, it may warrant saying to people who aren't familiar with these kind of communities that a fetish is not the same as kink. I don't know if we necessarily want to go into all of the nuances of that, because I don't want to get way too off topic there, but like, you can have a foot fetish, but having a fetish for feet does not mean that you are in a kink lifestyle or a kinky relationship. There are differences between the two things. But I also, I, I don't want people to hear, well, kink isn't sexual, and immediately jump to, all the bullshit that asexual people have gotten that have has only seemed to ramp up over the last couple of years where, oh, you're grooming children because you're trying to teach them that nothing is sexual so that you can lure them into sex things. <laughs> my, um, I'm sorry, my, um, my turf impression. I haven't honed it yet. It needs a little work. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things people say. And that that bad faith argument. <laughs> if you take the concept of, you know, kink is something that means different things to different people and immediately jump to you're going to do evil with this, you you're already you're already way too many steps away from where we need to be in this conversation. However, no, I do not think that kink is inherently sexual. It is sexual to some people. This is where there's a lot of very weird gray area. <laughs> and that's why we need to have this conversation. Because at a certain point, it's not just about you. It's about everybody around you if this is in a public setting. And that's where things get messy and muddy. So when I, you know, see people make the argument of, it's just leather daddies, it's just leather men... Yeah, someone might be wearing a pup mask, but they aren't even on a leash on their hands and knees. They're just walking in the parade, just wearing their gear. Here I'm going, there's nothing sexual about that. Nothing wrong, no harm, no foul. It, it's it's basically functioning as a costume at that point. And some of the more, more tame leather things, like if someone's just wearing a leather collar, for instance, some of that is very undistinguishable from just some other subcultures, like other gothic fashions and things of that nature. So no, 100% nothing inherently sexual, nothing wrong. But when you do have this separation of here's family-friendly hours, and you literally have a St. Andrew's cross that people are getting restrained, <laughs> and they are getting whipped, at that point, I kind of do have to say, like, 
have we set expectations correctly? I'm not even saying don't have it at all, because I think that's kind of up to each individual community and each individual pride to determine what their own community's needs are. But at that point, the expectations have not been sent. They, they have not been set for any parents who are bringing their children. Because I would not think St. Andrew's Cross and flogging is, is family friendly. I would not say that. And that's, that's why we need to actually talk about what this looks like. Because people can wear whatever the heck they want at Pride and any other time. If someone is literally complaining about a man wearing a leather harness, they need to get over themselves because that's that's getting into like slut shaming territory and we don't do that. <laughs> yeah, are are they showing more skin than a woman in a bathing suit? Well, um, for that matter, like I'm I'm very much free the nipple. So like I I am not a prude for showing skin or nudity. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to compare to existing public decency laws. Yes. So where would you want? I, I've seen some people even say like, even some people in the kink community saying like, is wearing a pup mask too much? I, I, I personally don't care. To me, that is clothing. <laughs> the line for, I think for me, and the line for a lot of people in the kink community whom I have listened to and learned from is consent is violated when you are acting out an actual kink scene in public with spectators who do did not consent to being a part of that scene. Yeah, it's the sort of exhibitionist scene that relies on the presence of others for the purpose of the scene. Which usually the kink community will condemn if they see someone violating the, the rules of public consent. And there are people who will call it very unethical to see that happen. And this is why I was still so confused to see this because there are, you know, a few different videos and, and any videos we reference will have in our show notes as per usual, if you'd like to see the entire thing. But Cat Black, for instance, is a pretty prominent YouTuber. She is a black trans woman and she is very involved in her local kink community and talks about all these sorts of topics. And it was it was like big news a couple of years ago where a, a woman was like walking a man in a pup mask in all fours, like just into a grocery store. And it made huge headlines. It was such a scandal. And Cat Black was one of many people involved in kink at that time who I saw coming out and saying, that's not okay. <laughs> the people at that grocery store did not consent to watching that scene. <laughs> And as spectators, they are a part of that scene. And so when, when I see people in the kink community condemning that, it makes me wonder how that conversation does translate to pride. Because most people in the kink community will just say, we belong here, and kind of leave it at that. I, I know I'm sure there are much more nuanced conversations happening in certain circles. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the larger, wider public sort of Twittery discourse, the YouTube discourse. But then I was kind of scratching my head because I was like, well, okay, if that's the line that ethical members of the kink community are drawing is that acting out a scene in public is violating the consent of onlookers, then surely they would be opposed to, you know, whipping and flogging and the cross in, in all of these things at pride out in the open, at least, at least not behind a like 18 and only tent. And so it, it so happened very shortly after condemning this one grocery scene, Cat Black did do a little video about kink at pride. And she said, you know, I, I went to pride a couple of times, but it's it's not really for me. So I don't go anymore. And I haven't been in a while. And she kind of said the same thing. She's like, well, most of the time people are just talking about a twink in a jock strap, <laughs> And that's fine. <laughs> And she said people aren't actually acting full-on kink scenes, because if they were, I would not be okay with that. I've talked about that before. I think that's unethical. And that's when I was like, but they, 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 that does happen at least sometimes. <laughs> and I do want to clarify, I want to make it abundantly clear that 
she does say that she doesn't condone people throwing out her earlier video about not condoning the kink scene in the grocery store. She doesn't like people using that video to justify no kink at Pride if, in fact, what you're arguing is really just down to what people are wearing. Because she does say repeatedly she is not in favor of kink scenes being acted out in public. So the reason why I am citing that video is I am saying, we saw a kink scene being acted out in public. Your mileage may vary. Maybe, maybe it is the fact that Kansas City Pride just fucked up. <laughs> maybe they absolutely should not have had that out in the open during those hours. And maybe a majority of kinksters would agree that that is not good practice. But I refuse to believe that that is the only Pride event in the entire world. <laughs> in the history of Pride events. In the history of Pride events that may have crossed a line. Because also, like, talking about tents, a lot of people do say, well, sometimes there is an 18 and over tent at Pride or a closed off 18 and over section where where there might even be nudity and there will be more overt kink scenes and it's sort of, you know, enter at your own consent kind of a situation. I'm not opposed to that. I think that's totally fine. That could have been the possible solution to this issue was not have the scenes happening in the storefront, like move that off somewhere else. Yes, and maybe because we... We didn't actually go during the like after dark hours because we were just making it like a midday trip kind of a thing. So I don't know what that looked like at our particular pride on that particular year. But the only like sectioned off tent that was present while we were there was like a young LGBT club, like under 18 club, which I do think that's cool. Like give... The kids and teens like their own place to talk to each other and meet each other. I think that's really, really valuable. But given the other things I saw, that made me wonder if the intent was to kind of shepherd all the kids over here and like, that's the kitty table, you guys go over there, then the adults play over here kind of a thing. Because I don't think that's quite the right answer either. Because again, the kids might want to buy a pride flag. <laughs> and I... I'm not a child psychologist. I don't know at what age it's, it might be appropriate for a child to see something like that. So I'm not qualified to speak on it. But Statistically, I think most children in their young adult teenage years have seen some sort of pornography. Oh, yeah. I'm not even necessarily worried about like the teens, but there there are some like under 10 kids that do occasionally come to these things. And I honestly think that's a good thing. Some people don't think that's a good thing, but like I, I was probably, I was probably 12 when I first saw Rocky Horror Picture Show. And that was like, my mother actively showed me that movie. And I loved it. I just loved how weird it was. <laughs> so I am not saying like a 12 or 13 year old is going to be scarred for life if they see someone getting flogged at a Pride event, because I think that's probably not going to be the case for the average kid. But I'm also not, you know, a trauma specialist, a trauma counselor. Are there people, children, teens, or even adults who could be triggered, could have negative reactions to just happening upon a scene like that when they weren't expecting it? I'm sure there are some people like that out there. To what extent, I do not know. And it's worth noting as well that there are plenty of people with trauma who actually work through some of that trauma and begin to heal by engaging in the BDSM community in a very healthy, consensual way. But not all traumas are the same. Not all people are the same. So I... I may have already branched like a little further than my expertise goes here, but that is something that I would be curious to learn more about. But the one thing that I, I do wonder if is a concern is when you do get into very young children, if they are seeing someone who is getting flogged, at what age is the child actually capable of understanding consent in that context. 
Particularly if they walk into the middle of a scene and not the beginning of it. Yes, because we should absolutely be teaching our kids consent at every stage of their development. But I have to believe that there is probably, and maybe a child psychologist could actually talk about this in detail. With me, it's just like, I'd like to know that. I, I want to dig in more to that. I could see there being a situation where a child is young enough where they can't conceptualize this as a healthy, consensual thing in a way that we as adults do, <laughs> or even how a teenager might. And I don't know what age that is, but there there probably is a developmental cutoff there at some point that, that might be worth actually finding and discussing. <laughs> yeah, without context of consent or culture, it kind of just looks like corporal punishment that people are watching for fun. Yes, <laughs> it, it looks like abuse. <laughs> So that's, that's sort of my bottom line there. So when I'm saying I do want to consider the children, that that is where my brain goes for what those considerations should actually be and what they need to look like. Because one thing I don't want is to throw that question out to a bunch of people who aren't educated on consent and child development and what this might or might not do to a child's psyche at different points in their development. I don't want to throw it out to people that know nothing about that and let them just answer based on their feelings. <laughs> I, I don't want people to just say like, well, that sounds icky, so I'm going to say no. <laughs> like, I, I want the studies. I, I want the people who are experts in this to weigh in on where that sort of line is. So for me, it's, it's the expectations. <laughs> and when we, when we boil down the conversation to is kink allowed at Pride, and we either don't define it at all, or we just say, it's just clothing. It's only clothing. No one's doing scenes. It's only clothing. We're doing everyone a massive disservice. Because if, if, there, if there were a council, a council of queers in charge of overseeing all Pride events, just very, very theoretically here, and they decide tomorrow, kink free for all. Pride, you can act out your kink scenes. We want to see leashes, whipping, flogs, bring it all. We're going for this all in. Do I think some people would stop going to Pride? Absolutely. But if, if those expectations were set and just everyone knew that, then yeah, it's going to be your own fault if you just show up. And the issue is... I think some people just kind of already treat that as a given. Some people are like, it's already a given that there are going to be kink scenes, but it's not because so many people are claiming that it's not happening. So it's, it's very weird. It's, it is weird of you guys. <laughs> it, is, it is weird of everybody who is making that argument in that way. And nobody is going to benefit from that. And I mean, that, that particular facet of that question is like, what should you expect when you go to Pride? <laughs> kind of bleeds into the, the question of like, well, who is Pride for? And the queer community is vast and not even everyone can agree on that. Not everyone can agree on that. <laughs> and there are some people who, I'm just gonna say, they're, they're wrong and they also don't get an opinion. Like, <laughs> like a turf who's, who thinks that, you know, being trans is a perverse choice. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm sorry, you, you don't get an opinion anymore on the Kink at Pride discourse because you have already proven yourself unreliable in this conversation. But there are some adults who just hate children. I'm going to say it because not a lot of people say it very often. I love children. I don't have my own. I don't plan to have my own. But I, I taught children for many, many years and I love kids. And I can't tell you how many times I have been in a queer space with a bunch of queer adults who do not have kids, never want to have kids, and just speak about children as if they are not human. They are subhuman. They are other. I don't want them near me. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to see them. I don't want to have to cater to them or allow them into the community. And like, that's not a queer person specific thing. Like there are just some, there are straight adults who hate children too, but man, there are some people who just hate kids. And so occasionally in this kink at pride discourse, I'll see it bleed into that territory. People being like, kids don't belong at pride anyway. Like I don't even want kids there. 
So why should I have to give up how I want to celebrate kink just because other people are bringing, and th this is this is how you know they hate kids because they'll start saying they're spawnlets or they're crotch goblins. It's like, okay, but that's, that's a young human you're talking about. <laughs> and like, I think those people are also wrong. <laughs> I think kids should be allowed to participate in pride. Well, saying that kids shouldn't participate in pride is kind of arguing against the born this way, like, concept. Like, kids are, are just as queer as adults. They just may not have everything figured out and have the words for it yet. Well, absolutely. And it, because it's, there are people who will say, you know, the kink community is subversive. Pride is a protest. We aren't here to make you comfortable and being open in our sexuality and our kink practices is an act of resistance and rebellion and protest. And I, I do think those are, are, are valid contributions to the conversation, but are we not at a point where having just like a horde of queer children, trans children, gay, lesbian, gender non-conforming, non-binary kids... Is that not also an act of defiance at this point in time when trans kids are getting their rights stripped away, when there are schools that won't let them go to the right bathroom, who are kicking them out of school for wanting to use the right bathroom, or trans athletes who are under attack for participating in school sports? It is. And also on the other side of things, to push back on the idea of modern pride as a protest Major corporations don't fund protests to increase their marketing reach or PR. But they have started funding pride celebrations. So I, I 100% get why people take the like family friendly concept with a grain of salt. Because there are corporations who do want to sanitize it a bit so that they can comfortably stamp their name on it to be like, look, we're queer friendly. We, su we support the LGBT community. We're allies. So that's another thing. Like the, the corporation shouldn't get a voice. Like they also, <laughs> I am gatekeeping this conversation. <laughs> People who hate kids don't get to participate. The corporations don't get to participate. The straight people do not get to participate and the turfs do not get to participate. You guys are all out of this conversation. <laughs> Well, and I, by straight, I mean not queer, and I know it's, it's not the opposite. What I mean by straight is the heterosexual, allosexual, cisgender, non-kinky, vanilla people. <laughs> like, not, not at all to discredit any straight aces or straight arrows or straight trans people. Just the people who aren't actually in the LGBT community they don't get to participate. But I do want the kink community to participate in this conversation, as long as they don't just like actively hate children. I, because there's, n we can't treat this conversation as a binary. It can't be kids or kinksters. Because that's it, that is never going to work from here on out for the rest of Pride history. That is not going to work. But the people who online so often defend the kink at pride concept, I'll call it, kind of do treat it like it's a binary conversation. They'll say like, kink belongs at pride, end of story. And to that I'd say yes, but there are nuances and there are problems to figure out and solve, which from what I can tell are not happening very well right now. <laughs> Because, yeah, I, I do see people saying like, well, kink, kink practitioners are oppressed. They are subversive. It's like queer kids are also oppressed. And I don't understand why that gets so little acknowledgement in the grand scheme of this conversation also. Because people also kind of treat it as like it's only the queer kids' parents who are raising these issues. I've seen lots of minors like... 14, 15, 16 year olds on Twitter who have said that they they have been uncomfortable with some of the things they've seen at Pride. It really makes me wonder what specifically they saw that made them uncomfortable. And un unfortunately, the discourse doesn't usually define that. That's been my biggest issue this whole time because 
Yeah, I would say if there's a teenager who is truly just taking issue with the way people are dressed because they're associating that with something inherently sexual, then there probably is something in there that they need to do a little bit of unpacking, a little bit of conservatism, perhaps even a little bit of unconscious slut-shaming. And like, listen, we all grow. <laughs> it, it is not a bad thing that is not a fundamentally bad person if as a teenager you do have some conservatism to unpack because I look back at my teenage years and as an asexual teenager, I was very much like the innocent one, the one who was simply aghast at people who are too promiscuous. And I, I wasn't like overtly like calling people names or being mean about it, but- You were just silently judgy? I was. Uh, there, there were times in my life where I was silently judgy, as, especially as a child. <laughs> Because I, I I had, like, a judgy adult in my life who kind of instilled some of those things. And, like, you, you unlearn those things as you grow. And so do I think that there are probably some teenagers that maybe do have a little bit of growing, a little unpacking to do? Yes. It's, it's, it's not a reason to be cruel to them or try to ostracize them from pride. But... On the other hand, if, if they actually have happened upon a, a full-on scene like we saw, or perhaps even worse, Cat Black mentioned at one point actually seeing pornography out in the open, I really hope that is very uncommon. I assume it's very, very uncommon, because I don't hear a lot of people talk about that, but if they happen upon something like that, I would have been so flustered and upset at that age. So I can absolutely understand, and like, like we've been talking about this whole time, somewhere there is a line. At some point, there's a line here. So they, they might actually have a case, <laughs> depending on what they individually saw. But when they come even close to approaching, like, kink at pride, everybody's alarm bells go off. But that's when all the, like, I hate kids comes out, because then they're like, well, then you shouldn't be coming. <laughs> You're not old enough. You don't learn your history, child. And that's gross. Like, why are we so mean to queer kids? Because we theoretically, as a community, talk about, like, we need to protect trans kids and we do activism so that queer kids can have a better life. But I see way more just, like, individual adult queer people being mean to queer minors online than I see people actually going out of their way to do activism to help lift up queer children. So obviously as a teenager, par part of the oppression of being a kid is that you get very little say. You do not get a seat at the table for decision-making things most of the time. So is that 14-year-old who is uncomfortable seeing certain aspects of kink at Pride, these kink scenes that do occasionally slip through the cracks and happen, no, they're probably not going to get to do anything about that, at least not for several years until they become an adult and, and join their local community in a decision-making capacity. But I don't think we should be completely, completely disregarding them either, because this community is supposed to be inclusive. And I really, really feel like it very often is not because people do get very set in their ways and their opinions, and anyone who has a different opinion doesn't get to talk. Their opinion doesn't matter. And that's really ironic, because I've been saying that this whole time. I've been like, TERFs don't get an opinion, corporations don't get an opinion. <laughs> but there are people who will do that like, you know, queer teenagers don't get an opinion. Like, well, why? Yeah, on what basis? On what basis, other than you hate kids? Is the argument being made in good faith or not? Yes. Well, and then also that gets used against asexual people. Because at this point in time, most asexual people will either not engage in this discourse or they will staunchly defend kink at pride and be like, don't use asexuals. Don't use asexuals. Don't you dare. Don't, don't blame us for this discourse. <laughs> which I get it because it's a mess. And there are, of course, asexual people who don't mind kink at pride. I, I said myself, my, my experience, I personally did not care. I just see all of you lying online and I had to say something about it. 
But there, there are also asexuals who do engage in kink. There are kinky asexuals who love it. In fact, I, I will plug a YouTube channel. Evie Lupine is an asexual kink YouTuber. They are out there. They exist. And I, I did watch a video of hers on public play. And this wasn't pride specific. It was just in general. And the very clear distinction was made between wearing kink associated clothing, wearing collars, etc., and actually doing a scene. So she was she was kind of echoing what Cat Black had mentioned, what I said earlier. And she was talking about the ethics of that. And not everybody is a voyeur. Not everybody is going to be comfortable or okay witnessing a kink scene. So she, as a member of the kink community, as a practitioner of kink, was talking about ethical ways that you can do a scene in public, and it was all talking about subtlety. She was saying that, you know, true exhibitionists who, what they get out of this is the fact that it's being sort of sprung on an unsuspecting member of the public. She said, from her experience, it's probably a minority in the community, and people who actually you know, act on that in very public ways are almost certainly not a part of the ethical kink community. But she said people who do engage in ethical kink, and they do get something from a scene in a public setting, she said it's very much a risk versus reward, the fear of getting caught versus the joy of getting away with something. And if you keep that basic concept, then there's a lot of room to play with that where you can keep things low key and and she gave a lot of examples so if anybody actually is listening who is new to kink or interested in getting in kink i definitely recommend her channel this video and many others but she gave a lot of examples for how to keep it subtle and reinforcing the fact that if you are doing some form of public play the people around you should not be able to identify what you are doing at a glance. So obviously it is reductive to say or assume that any and all asexuals will be uncomfortable with any kink presence at Pride because that is not correct. But every now and then when I do say like, well, maybe we need to talk about this a little more because what about sex repulsed asexuals who I think also belong at Pride? Every time I see someone even dip their toe into that water, I see them dogpiled. Sometimes even by other asexuals. Other asexual people being like, I am asexual and I think kink belongs at Pride. And it's... That goes back to, there are some good faith arguments. There are some <laughs> that, that should be engaged with. Because I, I have had private conversations with some other sex-repulsed asexuals who have said, you know, kind of, kind of the same thing I've said in the sense that, like, I don't care what other people are wearing, because clothing is none of my business, even if it's, you know, tangentially kink-related. But... I have talked to people who are very uncomfortable being in public when scenes are happening around them, when people are acting out kink scenes. So to say that it is only the straight parents who are bringing their queer kids to Pride that have an issue with this is also erasing some actual valid feelings of some people who are in the community. And I have absolutely see, seen some of these people say that, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can really speak up about it, though, because... Not only am I going to be demonized, but potentially all of asexuality is going to be demonized. <laughs> and that's just not fair, and that is just not okay. And that kind of just proves to me that this line of discourse has taken a very toxic turn. Toxic and reductive. And often completely false. I can't- I cannot get over that. <laughs> Anybody listening who has also seen like kink scenes at Pride that were outside of any sort of after dark hours, outside of any sort of 18 and over tent, with no expectations set ahead of time, like please tweet at us and tell me that I am not the only one. 
because for years looking at this discourse, I'm like, did, did we just get incredibly unlucky? Are we the only ones in the entire world? It can't be. I refuse to believe it. It just can't be. But it's very weird. Because it's honestly, I mean, I, I mentioned too that I have personally seen much worse at goth clubs. But even at those goth clubs, and I'm thinking of at least three different ones where there has been, you know, full on as nude as is legally possible, <laughs> saran wrapping people to poles, shibari, all just about anything you can think of shy of actual full on nudity and intercourse. It happens at goth clubs. There are fetish nights all the time. There are kink nights all the time. There are some clubs that just kind of always have that presence. But A, going into those spaces, I know ahead of time that it's there. Expectations have been set. But also, even in those situations where I know it's going to be there, it's almost always like in a side room where I don't have to be right there watching it if I don't have to be. And I, I guess to go back to that Cat Black video, she said she usually doesn't go to Pride and, and isn't going to go anymore. But she did say at one Pride that she went to, there was just like gay pornography playing somewhere where it was very easy to see out in the open when it wasn't blocked off or 18 and over at all. And that any kid could have walked by and seen exactly what she saw. And I've never seen anything that extreme, I believe. I think she's in LA, so that was probably in LA Pride. I haven't seen anything near that at Kansas City Pride or any of the other smaller, <laughs> like, Midwestern cities. But I'd be pretty upset, personally. I, 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 I would be pretty upset if I went to a Pride event and just, without my consent, was exposed to actual video pornography. I, I would be really upset, and I cannot be the only asexual. I cannot be the only queer adult that feels that way. So like there are definitely lines. And this is this is why I want more nuanced conversation with the people who are a part of the queer community who do have valid concerns about this, but also the kink community who really care about ethical practice and consent. Because if you're doing kink right, consent should be integral to everything that you do. <laughs> And I just, may, maybe again in small circles it has happened, but I have just not seen a kinkster condemn something that has happened at Pride. Like, I went to Pride and I saw this person who stepped over the line and I do not think that that is ethical and we need to talk about what that line is. I have not seen that on a big public scale. And I feel like we almost need something like that to start to move the conversation forward. Because right now it's not going forward. <laughs> It's just kink belongs at pride and occasionally, but what about children or question mark, maybe aces? And it's like, no, get out of here. <laughs> you, <laughs> that, that's about it. And then it's like, oh, it's just people wearing leather. That's all. That's all kink at pride is nothing to see here, folks. And then that we just repeat that every, every single year, every single year during pride month and like the month or two leading up to it. This is, this is just our lives. <laughs> Unless we we move that needle forward somehow. And any evolution of this conversation absolutely needs to have the kink community involved. We do not, as non-kink community queer people, get to oust them or, or suggest that they don't have a presence there. So anyone reducing it to no kink at Pride at all, period, is wrong. <laughs> and may, maybe it is. Maybe it is the fact that... There are people in the kink community who, knowing the history, being involved in whatever capacity they are, do think this is a totally safe space to practice kink and do scenes out in the open, and that is their expectation coming into Pride. Other people who are not in the kink community are not having that expectation set for them. So you, you are going to have issues when people have totally different sets of expectations for where they're going, what they're getting into, what it's going to look like, what they're going to see. And that can become a major safety issue because when that happens on this large of a scale <laughs> with this big of a community fracture, there is no such thing as informed consent. <laughs> it's, it is expectations that need to be set. And 
I can't drive that home enough, and there's... There is no way to solve this problem on this podcast. <laughs> We're just ruminating, maybe ranting a little bit. And again, I'm not saying no kink at pride. I'm not even saying like all kink at pride. I'm just saying there's, there is a line of consent somewhere that we are refusing to talk about <laughs> in a meaningful way. And also, can you guys just stop lying? I'm gonna throw a chair through a window the next time I see people say like, Kink at Pride is just leather. It's just a twink and a thong. <laughs> at what kink? What kink are you at? Or what pride are you at? That that is the only kink presence and nothing else. It also kind of makes me wonder, like, are people so involved in the argument that they aren't actually thinking back to the prides they've been to and, like, really... Because I could see kink things and scenes, like, even the whipping and flogging, if it didn't stand out to me as so weird as something that happened during the supposed family-friendly hours in broad daylight next to the face painting and shit. Like, if that didn't strike me as so weird, for me personally, it probably would have just bled into the background. And I might not retroactively be thinking about it right now. So maybe some people are just a little desensitized to kink or they're involved in kink in the sense that, you know, what they do in private is so kinky that everything they see publicly is quite vanilla. That's, that's a possibility, but... We have to be aware of our own experiences and our own biases and know that not everybody has exactly the same feelings on the matter. I just care about consent. Consent and inclusion. <laughs> I do want to talk about public kink scenes in more specific detail. Because we, we can talk all day about how, well, something that's sexual to someone isn't necessarily sexual to this person. But when you are in public, when you are a member of a community, there is some level of responsibility that you have as a person in a community. And it fully well may be that the lines at Pride are different than the lines at the average public space. But regardless, in any situation across the board, there is going to be a time where your personal expression and actions is going to be intertwined enough with the people around you and the people present that, I guess I, I don't know how to phrase it, that you're going to have some sort of responsibility to the people around you and not just your own personal actions. Because at some point it is going to affect them. Yeah, certain activities, even if it's only two people who are physically involved, will require group consent, essentially, just due to the nature of the activity. Yes, and people are going to have different opinions <laughs> about what that line is, when is the line crossed, which doesn't make the discourse easier, but just because it's nearly impossible to come up with one solid singular answer that's a one-size-fits-all doesn't mean that it's not worth examining. <laughs> because, I mean, uh, talking about what's sexual to one might not be sexual to another. I don't like seeing people make out. I don't. I would, I would rather I never have to see two people making out ever again. You know what? Especially straight people. <laughs> Preferably nobody, because I just, I don't like it, but especially straight people, because I see a gay couple making out, and it's like, good for them, we've come so far. But like, I see, I see a straight couple making out, and I'm like, ew, gross! <laughs> now I'm gonna sound bigoted to the straights. Uh, <laughs> but like, I know that as an asexual who is on the side of sex repulsion, I know that <laughs> my guard is going to be a little higher than the average person where it comes to just, like, kissing. But I know that, like, kissing in public, making out in public is so normalized for straight people that, like, there is no question any queer couple is allowed to do exactly those same things. No strings attached. I don't have to like it. That, that falls into the category of that's my problem. But at what point? <laughs> at what point... Would another single person, a, a couple, a group of people, at what point would their actions actually be their bad because of how it's affecting me? Because I do think there's a line. 
There is. I think that line is often personal. I think different people are going to be in a different area of that gradient, but it doesn't help that all of the discourse around this goes from clothing to penetrative intercourse yes without skipping a beat with like nothing nothing in between so i don't have any reference for anyone else's opinions we, we, <laughs> we've we've heard that we've tried to find them we've actively searched for them <laughs> we know that most people say do not enact a public kink scene that other people can identify as a kink scene that is but, something that is commonly said yes but that is vague yes And I do want the answer of, is the line pushed a little farther at Pride? Because I have heard people say in the same conversation, people who are kinksters, who will say, you know, I don't condone a public scene, like I don't want flogging in front of children, but kink deserves to be at Pride, there needs to be a kink presence, and all of that, and... I don't think that it should be any different at Pride, but I think that because our society still has a lot of things to push back on, it probably is going to be a little bit, you know? Like, yeah, go, going back to like Pride is still trying to push the envelope. It is still it is. a like, protest and subversive. Go, going to a Pride festival, even though these expectations haven't been explicitly set and they're definitely being overstepped in some cases, it isn't exactly the same as going to a nearby park on a standard weekend. Like, your yes. your expectation for going to a festival, a queer festival, is at least a little bit different. I think we should achieve a future state in society where it isn't any different, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, well, and I mean, there there's such a vast array of kink scenes, too. And in the scope of this podcast, I'm we, we've only mentioned a couple. We mentioned the grocery store with you know, a dominatrix walking her gimp in a grocery store, and we mentioned the St. Andrew's cross in the flogging, but there's a a spectrum of (laughs) kink scenes that are out there. The grocery store's a bit of a different story, though, because that is private commercial property, and to a certain extent that business can set some of its own rules, like private establishments can have somewhat different attire rules than just the public. That's true, but in a situation where, like, no one's actually going to throw them out, there are still people who are going to be like, I still think you overstepped something. It wasn't technically illegal, but you still crossed a boundary. (laughs) So that's that's where it gets money. Because even even at Pride, most well-organized... Pride events are going to have some level of code of conduct, so it's 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 not this lawless experiment Ex- experiment experience by any means. But yeah, I guess everyone's going to be different. For me personally, like I said, I I personally was unaffected by seeing someone flogged at Pride, but it probably would have been worse for me if it was a more intimate environment. <laughs> Things people do in public, I can sort of, like, mentally distance myself from it a little bit. Or physically. Or physically. Like, I can I can go somewhere else usually. But I, I have friends who have participated in kink scenes around me and in public. And I've known, I've known several people who are just involved in a kink lifestyle. And there have been a couple of times... <laughs> Where I have been present and I have not been comfortable with it, even though I know this person, I like this person, it's kind of just like, why didn't you wait for me to leave? (laughs) Did I have to be here for this? Yeah, I've had that happen too. And it's particularly tough when you're the new one to the group. Oh, sure. And are not really sure, like... Is everyone else fine with this? Is this just me? Does this happen all the time? Can Mm. I, should I really say anything? Yeah, that can be really uncomfortable because in in a situation like that, say you meet a new group of people or a group of acquaintances that maybe you aren't that close to, but they've gotten comfortable enough that they're going to be doing a kink scene in front of you without discussing that with you first. They've kind of made you a part of that scene without your consent because now now you're here and you're observing it in close proximity and it can be very awkward and very uncomfortable if expectations weren't set. So to to a certain extent, that can also happen at Pride. There will be a line somewhere. 
It's a gray one. It's a blurry one. But it is there somewhere. And people, people who are on the no kink at pride side of this conversation, or reduced kink at pride, whatever, whatever they're saying or claiming, whenever they elicit this, you know, think about the children narrative, we also kind of have to define children because if it's, if it's truly just clothing, if it is just scantily clad people in leather, like they are not going to be causing harm to the seven-year-old who is there with their parents. But if, if you're an older, you know, middle-aged adult, older adult, and you're using kids as in like minors or people in their late teens, if, if we think like mid to late teens is the age of consent in most, if not all states. So there are absolutely going to be queer teenagers coming to Pride who have either already started exploring their sexuality or are about to. And a certain percentage of them are already just naturally going to be curious about kink. And I don't think that's just because they've been exposed to that. I really, really do think that there are some people who at a very young age, before they even realize what their sexuality is, might have very early memories of like a precursor to kink. That is something that is documented and I've heard people talk about. Yep, can confirm. (laughs) Yep, can confirm. Okay, so... (laughs) Do you want to share that story now? I don't really want to make it a story. I think I'm comfortable with saying that I can very clearly remember something that is very obviously kink aligned at the age of eight. But when I had those sorts of dreams, it wasn't new. And so I think I can vaguely remember at eight being like, oh, this is kind of like some dreams I had when I was around five. But I also remember thinking back on being five at the age of eight, remembering that it wasn't exactly new then either. (laughs) And so I'm pretty sure, like, earliest memories I have are about three, and I'm pretty sure there were some inclinations there. Oh, and I mean, I do too. I wouldn't call them sexual thoughts, because they weren't, and they aren't, and I am completely asexual. But in in my childhood, I, I can think of memories like that too. And I don't think that people always want to, like, think about children having thoughts like that or dreams, but it does happen. (laughs) And that's another situation where it's not inherently sexual also. But if, if we're, you know, fast forwarding and saying some of these kids who maybe had these proclivities at a younger age are now getting into their teenage years, they are at the age of consent, and maybe they're curious to start experimenting with some entry level kink things. I hope to hell that there are kinksters there. I want there to be a sex-positive, like, consent-teaching information booth with, like, brochures (laughs) with people who are in the kink community who are there who can make sure that anyone who is going to do this on their own regardless, like, this is the same conversation we have with sex ed, like, teenagers are gonna have sex, they need healthy, safe information. Same thing with kink here. It's going to happen for some people. They need that safe information. and They sure as hell are not getting it in school. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Or from their parents. Probably not from their parents either. And (laughs) early experimenting in BDSM relationships can get really abusive if you don't know what to look for. 100%. It is very much a safety thing. So I would hope that there is a presence of older people who have been there, done that, who know the ins and outs, who can say, look, here are the red flags. Here are the warning signs. This is what consent means. And teach them. (laughs) So... I I know there is some some hyper conservative person or some very exclusionary turfy person out there who again is going to try to take this to well you're grooming the children no probably not a, a leather daddy who has lived through the AIDS crisis is not trying to sleep with the teenager who just became of age they just want to make sure. <laughs> that they are going to be safe and healthy. 
Or for that matter, it's just, you know, a, a deeply bigoted, homophobic, fascist on the other end of a sock puppet account who is just trying to stir things up to get everyone so riled up that not only do we spend our energy debating them, which is going to waste everyone's time, but also get everyone so riled up that we're going to fight each other, even when there are some people who have nuances to add to the conversation. And that that goes back to what we were saying about how the community online is not very good at distinguishing the difference between a good faith argument and a bad faith one. And I mean, that's by design. There are people who hate the queer community, whether there is kink or not, whether there are asexual people or not, whether there are trans people or not. There are just some people who hate us and want to tear us apart. So it, it is very much by design. And unfortunately, several of those groups of people are much more organized and deliberate than our little fractured communities tend to be. Mm, that's very, very true. That is very, very true. Because really, like... The only real answer to this is if you have ideas to contribute, if you see a change that you think needs to be made, it's probably not going to be productive to go online and argue with other queer people. If you have the ability to, the more productive thing would probably be to find out how you can volunteer with your local pride event. Find out if they have any board positions available, if you can talk to people who are on the board. Maybe you want to set up your own separate event that is still very much a part of the Pride sphere, but maybe you do say, like, I, I want an event over here that is exceptionally family-friendly, and we're going to document exactly what that means, and that's what I want. It's not going to replace what you're doing over here but it'll be a supplement. And I mean, for that matter, I think it'd be really cool if there were more places for queer people to meet in queer spaces that don't really revolve around alcohol so much, because the actual like pride parade and the pride sort of festival isn't super heavy on alcohol consumption, but a lot of the branch off events and the after parties, like it's, it's go to a bar. And like, that can be really alienating, not only for minors who are also trying to find community and establish themselves, but also for adults who are sober. So yeah, I guess, I guess getting involved. <laughs> don't, don't just argue with people online, try to do something about it if it bothers you, which is maybe a little ironic because here I am griping on a podcast about <laughs> something we saw at our pride, but there, there has to be some level of expectation, I think. You know, honestly, here, here's an interesting experiment. So it's been so long since we've been to a Pride because, you know, we, we missed a year, maybe two, but then we've been heavy quarantined ever since the pandemic started. So we did not go to 2020 or 2021 Pride. So we're, we're several years removed from this ourselves right now, and I will admit that. But, and we're, we're still very, very much self-isolated, so we, we will also not be attending this year. <sighs> Hopefully someday we'll be back. But just for my own curiosity, I'm going to pull up our local Kansas City Pride website, and I'm just going to see what expectations there are based on, like, let's, let's say, for instance, I'm a parent to a, we'll say, 10-year-old queer person. And I want to say, oh, well, let's take them to Pride. I've never been to a Pride before myself. I'm, I'm a straight person now. I'm a straight mother. Imagine. And I, I want to do some research about this Pride. So Parade and Pride Fest information. We have where is it? What are the hours? Where can I park? What's the cost? Can I bring food and drink? Is it accessible? Oh, that's another thing. Pride is not always all that accessible. <laughs> what items are allowed? What items aren't allowed? Very, very basic and I don't know what they're going to have this year. Maybe, maybe that one year that we were there and we saw what we saw, maybe that was an anomaly. And maybe someone at the board found out about that and was like, nope, that's stepping over the line. We're not going to have that anymore. I don't know. I don't know. So I can't say for certain there's going to be public flogging this year. But 
This probably isn't too far away from what we read before we went. And all it says for setting expectations is Pride Fest is an LGBTQ plus festival featuring a main stage with local acts, vendors, food trucks, family activities, and more. The festival will take place from Friday through Sunday at this park. All ages welcome. Sunday is focused on family-friendly entertainment and activities. So all ages welcome, all of the days, but Sunday is family-friendly entertainment and activities. But they don't say what family-friendly means or what non-family-friendly means. So that's letting everyone set their own expectations. That is way too vague. And more. And more! And honestly, I, I don't know if it's just that they haven't put it up on their website or maybe they haven't put it up yet. Or maybe they don't have it anymore, but I'm not even seeing anything about the kids' tent. I know for sure when we went, there was like, this kids' tent is there every single day. Every single day it was there for a kids' club meetup. And I do think that was really cool. I also think it was probably sponsored by a bank. I, I don't know which bank it was, but it was, it was, it probably was something like Commerce Bank Queer Kids Club or something, so... I mean, maybe maybe they dropped the, the corporate funding, but I don't see anything about that here. So I don't know if it's just gone or if they're yet to add new information in the upcoming weeks. So that that's where I do think there needs to be more communication. I'm saying don't go online to, to talk to other people because this, this conversation is just has not progressed online at all. But between each individual Pride event and the local community who might be showing up, I think there might be more room for expectation setting. Because if we just say, like, all kink goes, it's allowed, that's what Pride is for, deal with it. It's not my favorite option. But as long as you tell everybody that well ahead of time, then they can at least opt out before they arrive and become aghast at what they see before them. <laughs> know what I mean? Because let me also acknowledge the fact that there are absolutely some parents who are bringing their kids to Pride who do not have any issues with their children being exposed to whatever level of kink is at that particular Pride. That does not mean they are bad parents. <laughs> that means they are parents who are prepared to answer their kids' questions if they have them, hopefully. It means they are parents who are prepared to help give their children proper sex education as they're growing up, and even to, again, talk about consent with them, because con consent really does need to be taught at a very, very young age. And of course, do it in age-appropriate ways, like teach a toddler. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, I, I know some parents who have taught their toddlers with, you know, pets if they have a dog or a cat, like to look for signs that the, the cat doesn't want to be pet right now. And as they get a little older, you know, use it with hugs and just progress as the child does, but keep the concept of consent continuously present and accurate and evolving. So it's, it's still very disingenuous for people to say like, well, parents don't want their kids to see this because that's not everybody. It's, it's just not. And it also very much becomes an issue when the conversation veers off of the children and just sort of like, well, what will the rest of society think of us? <laughs> because <laughs> that happens too. There are absolutely people who will try to play into this like purity politics of, oh, we're not scandalous sexual people. It is it is all about romantic love and love is love and two men who love each other are exactly the same as a man and a woman who love each other and it's all very pure and good-hearted. That shit never works. Like, they, if a straight person is saying, but how will other people perceive you? And I mean by straight, I, I mean <laughs> cisgender, heterosexual, non-kinkster, vanilla, allosexual person, not queer, not a part of the queer community, if they're saying that they're an asshole and ignore them, it gets trickier when other queer people are saying that. 
because that's also not a new thing. There are always going to be queer people, normally the ones with more privileges, the ones who are still cisgender, the ones who are probably white, the ones who think if they sort of play along with being, you know, a palatable queer, then maybe they'll acquire some more privileges. And it, it's all just about how we present ourselves. And this bid to be more palatable to outsiders, it it, it doesn't work. It, it never has. If we banish all kink from pride, they'll just find a new way to hate us. And kink is kind of just like an easy foothold for bigots to grab onto because people have such this, this big emotional reaction to kink. Because again, most people consider it to be very sexual. Most people are very uneducated about it. Most people don't know what it is or what it looks like. So kink where there are children sounds bad to people who don't really know what that means. And I, I don't 100% want to say do not listen to other queer people who are saying that because I do think they're wrong, but I do also have compassion for this sort of fear and discrimination that comes from being a queer person. And there are definitely some people who are just going to try to play the game for a better life. I don't think it's the right answer. I think history tells us it doesn't work. And I think we can still talk to those people who have those concerns if they are in fact a part of our community in hopefully a very level-headed, informative way. And we don't just lump them in with all of the sock puppet fascist accounts <laughs> who are actively trying to tear the community apart. Because man, for, for as much as we say, we as a minority community are not a monolith. We very do often treat ourselves like a monolith because we will say, if you don't agree with us, you do not belong in our community. And I don't think that's right. But I also said it's not new and it's not. This has been happening for decades. So this is an ongoing sort of internal conflict within the community. And to pretend like that's also not happening and that it's only the straight parents is also a little disingenuous because the, the leather community in particular was not only integral to early pride, they were there right from the beginning, but the leather community were some of the first to actually organize and care for the sick members of the community during the AIDS crisis. Some of the people on the front lines were the Leathermen and women in the leather community too. We haven't talked about them much yet because they aren't in the discourse a lot, which I find a little odd. The discourse online is always like, oh, the twink in a harness. But like, there, there are women in the leather community that have also been here this entire time. Like, dykes on bikes, a staple of pride. <laughs> and some of the frontline heroes during the AIDS crisis. So they are very important to the community, have always been very important to the community. But even then, when queer sex was this frightful thing that you could die from, there were definitely sections of the community that were trying to publicly distance themselves from other members of the community that couldn't be as easily separated from the concept of sex. So even though leather men and leather women, all the people within the kink community who are doing all this fantastic heroic work and caring for these sick and dying people, they also had other people saying, you know, we, you're, you're kind of bad for our public image. <laughs> Can you uh, not pose in those pictures with us? We're, we're gonna stand over here, you stay over there. Like it's not kind, but it is not new. And so that's why it's, it's really messed up anyone who just blankly says no kink, none at all. That tells me that they probably don't know what they're saying and they probably don't know the history. The history is important, yes. And I also think probably defining kink, <laughs> defining kink at pride, more often these conversations is also important. Cause let me tell you, it didn't work back then. <laughs> Gay men trying to distance themselves from the leather community did not make people less homophobic. And so the kinksters are the easy target cause you can get more people with a knee jerk reaction to them. We see that in the asexual community too. 
where so many people know so little about asexuality that if you can be the first to kind of get to them and tell some lies and sprinkle in some, like, asexual conspiracy theories about how, how, how deviant those asexuals actually are and what they're doing to your children, then you can sort of try to get the ignorant people on board with you. Because it's, it's a little easier than just saying, you know, in this the year 2022, I hate gay people. Because probably most people are going to be like, that's not cool. <laughs> but not everyone comes to the defense of the aces, and not everybody comes to the defense of the kinksters. So they start with those easy targets, trans people as well, and they get their foot in the door. And once they've planted those seeds, the infestation spreads, and they will be coming for you next. Is that sufficiently dramatic enough? <laughs> Yeah, one common theme I think I've seen coming from baited communities of different types and throughout recent history is how they have this tendency to lump everything outside of their worldview or their view of the human experience into the same giant bucket of deviancy. Mm. Like, if you take the traditional religious conservative who only believes in the nuclear family, a man and a woman who are both straight living together and having children... They may see any existence, any human expression outside of their own as deviant. TERFs are very similar in that many of them believe that heteronormativity, homosexuality, and bisexuality to certain extents exist, but then everything outside of that doesn't, is some form of deviancy. And it's because they lump all of these other identities into this one group, this one non-existent or irregular group, and... Label it all perverse. Label it all perverse that they can so easily jump from, say, homosexuality to pedophilia to bestiality because some of them literally may not see a difference. Exactly! I mean, <laughs> before gay marriage was legalized in this country, like, you'd, you'd see conservatives be like, gay marriage? What's next? Are people going to be wanting to marry their dogs? Calm down, conservatives. It's it, it, it's fine. Calm, calm down. But that's, I mean, that's what we see in turfism, too. That's why people who are so set in their gender ways see transgender people as something that is perverse. They are not. They are just people. But that's where you see the turf sort of pipeline start with, oh, well, you know, we're, we're just a little gender critical. What does gender really mean? That seems harmless on the surface. That's how they get you and reel you in. But once they get their hooks into you deep enough to say, well, actually, it is wrong to be transgender. It's something perverse because it's not actually real gender. It's, it's something different. And if it's not actually real gender, then it must be you know, just someone getting their sick kicks. You know, it's it's just a fetish to these people. And from that point, they follow the same logic. Well, pedophiles, groomers. It is sick and twisted and bigoted, but that is how these people think. Maybe we should do an, a future episode on, like, the acephobe to turf pipeline. I feel like every time I tweet about evidence of people starting with hating asexuals, then falling down the turf rabbit hole, and then openly admitting that hating asexuals was their entry point, I feel like a lot of people get really surprised. They're either like, wait, what? I did not know that. Or they, they straight up don't believe me. But sometimes that is people's actual entryway. There is a lot more overlap to this line of thinking than you might think, and it's because uh, bigotry is bigotry. Bigot's gonna bigot. So I do think we are probably going to wrap it up about there. I think those are the main points, and like I said, two of us talking into a microphone are not going to solve the kink at pride discourse, but I do hope that that gave you a couple of new thoughts to ponder whenever this discourse does come up, because I suspect it will inevitably come up again. But otherwise, I do wish all of you a very happy remainder of your Pride Month. If you are someone who is going to the Pride parades, the Pride festivities of any kind, I hope it is safe and pleasant for you. And we will talk to you all next week.